Noemi Stan. Who will present today her thesis entitled Complex Systems Perspectives on Large Scale Weather and Climate Variability Patterns, completed under the guidance of professors uh, Emilio Hernández Garcia, that is here, Cristobal López, that is online, and Professor Ray Donner, that is also here. I would also like to introduce to you the committee members forming the panel that will evaluate the thesis. Uh, I am Professor Cristina Masoyer. I am with the Universidad Politécnica Catalunya in Terrassa. Uh, with me is Dr. Enrico Sergiacomi, uh, that is from Six Mallorca. I think most of you know him. And online is Dr. Um, Jonathan Donges from PIC uh, in Potsdam, Germany. So please, Noemi. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And um... Yes, so my thesis was part of an uh, Marie Curie ITN, so Innovative Training Network, called CAFE. CAFE stands for Climate uh, Advanced Forecasting of Subseasonal Extremes. And the objective of CAFE was to improve the predictability of extreme weather events. So that's extreme temperatures, for instance, or extreme rainfalls um, at the subseasonal time scale. So from 10 days um, up to three months. Um, one of the motivations behind this is that uh, it has been seen in the past uh, decades that the frequency of such or many of such events um, has been increasing. And in many cases, they are also projected to further increase with climate change. Okay, so in practice, the predictability of extreme uh, events often comes from their modulation by large scale weather and climate phenomena. And here I just show two examples. So we have atmospheric blocking, which are uh, pressure patterns in the mid latitudes. So um, this one here. Then we have uh, the El Nino southern oscillation um, in the tropical Pacific, and the Madden Julian oscillation, which is a, a moving convective system in the tropics. Um, so all these uh, phenomena influence or can trigger uh, different types of extremes. And as such, they represent potential sources of predictability for extreme weather. Now, all of them occur on very different um, time scales and temporal, temporal scales, uh, uh, spatial scales. And so in my thesis, I studied all three of them using three different methodologies from complex systems. So the-, the... Excuse me, can you hear me? <laughs> Excuse me, uh, please could you share the screen? <laughs> Yeah, the, the screen is not shared. Please, could you share the screen? Uh, <laughs> yeah, the slides, I cannot see the slides. <laughs> we cannot. The screen is shared. Sorry, Gabor. The screen is shared. Ah, okay. Uh, sorry, then. <laughs> okay. I take the opportunity to ask everyone to turn the mobile uh, off or in silence, please. Okay, so, um, well, uh, okay, so Go there, ahead. Are, there are three parts uh, in these presentations. Uh, the first part, I will explain how we can use uh, Lagrangian flow networks to represent the atmosphere and uh, find um, key characteristics of blocking events. Then in the second part, uh, we will use a different type of network based on correlation to anticipate abrupt changes in systems with irregular oscillations and especially climatic oscillations um, with application to El Nino, for instance. And then in the third part, uh, we'll see, uh, we'll look at the model for the Madden Julian oscillation. Okay, so let's go to the first part. So first, um, atmospheric blocking events are large scale pressure patterns in the mid latitudes, um, and they are characterized by their persistence. So they can remain in place from several days up to several weeks. And when this occurs, um, it produces extreme uh, events. Uh, for instance, like in the high in the high pressure cell of the block, uh, typically in summer, we get heat waves. Um, in winter, they are more associated with uh, cold spells. It can also create extreme rainfalls by deviating certain atmospheric currents. Um, 
in reality, they look uh, more like this. So uh, here you have a map of the Northern Hemisphere and uh, the lines correspond to the geopotential heights. So uh, at 500 hectopascals. So they are like the, the pressure controls. Um, and the deformation of these lines indicate the location of the block here. And then the color in this picture correspond to the zonal wind speed. Okay, now the objective of this study was to construct a um, network description of the atmospheric flow called the Lagrangian flow network. And the advantage of the network is that then we can use the tools uh, that were developed in the context of graph theory to explore the flow properties. So what we want to know is which flow property the network measures can highlight, and especially how well can they capture um, um, atmospheric circulation patterns which are associated with blocking events. So this is the outline for this part. I will first explain how the network is constructed, and then we'll see the results for uh, different network measures. Okay, so in general, uh, this is how uh, we construct a Lagrangian flow network. So the idea is to divide the flow domain into a number of boxes, and those boxes represent the nodes uh, of the network. So nodes are spatial location. Then in each box, we uh, initialize a number of particles, and we simulate their trajectories in the flow. So in our case, this will be in the wind field. Uh, and then after a certain time, we stop the simulation and we look where particles have traveled. So if there is exchange of material of particles between box PI and box PJ, then we set up a link between those two boxes. And the higher the amount of material that traveled, the higher the weight of the link. Um, in our case, we're interested in blocking events in the Northern Hemisphere. So this is the domain. So each uh, box here, represent uh, one network node. And we extend the domain a bit to the southern hemisphere just to avoid boundary conditions uh, at the uh, yeah, boundary effect at the, the, the equator. And then to set up the links, we need to integrate the particle trajectories in the wind field. So this is done uh, using a software which is called FlexPart. So we give FlexPart information about the wind field and samples like so on. Um, and then it returns these trajectories. Typically, the integration times that we use uh, range from eight hours to one. But this gives you a rough idea of the time scales. So once we have the Lagrangian flow network describing the atmospheric flow, what we want to know is if this network can capture uh, the patterns that are associated with atmospheric blocking events. So here I will present um, the results for two different measures, the degree and the harmonic closeness centrality. In my thesis, we also look at uh, the entropy. Okay, so the, the, the degree is um, one of the simplest measures that one can use uh, in a network. So it's the number of connection of a node I to any other node. And uh, physically in the flow network, it represents the stretching uh, of the flow at node I. So if you think of uh, the material contained in this box being advected and then stretched like this, you can see that the more stretched it is, the higher the number of links and so the higher the degree. Um, so this is the degree field during a blocking event. So again, we have um, uh, a map of the Northern Hemisphere in the background, then the lines go to potential heights and the, their deformation here indicate the location of the block. And the color corresponds to uh, the value of the degree. So we see that in the center of the block, in the region of the high pressure cell, we have very low degree values, which su suggests that they are not uh, well connected to the rest of the atmospheric flow. And then we also have region with high degree values. Uh, they typically occur in front um, upstream of the perturbation and in regions where the wind uh, is really strong, like here, for instance, we checked that the jet was really strong in this region. For comparison, we can look at the degree field outside of a blocking event. Um, and well, essentially we just see the absence of such an extended region of low degree at 16 off. Okay, then we can look at a different measure, which is the 
uh, closeness centrality, the harmonic closeness centrality. The formula is given here, and um, essentially it's, well, this dij represents the distance between nodes, so it's the mean of the inverse distance to other nodes. So it like kind of measure how close a vertex is to other vertices. Now, what close means depends on the definition of this distance. And in our case, we set the individual link distances to one of the weights of the link. The weight represents the amount of material that is exchanged. So by doing so, what we are doing is that the cells that exchange a lot of material look like they're very close together. And the ones that don't exchange much material look like they're very far apart. Um, and the reason why we do that is because in this way, we can highlight chains of cells that are connected with large flux exchanges. So that's the, the main flow currents. Okay, so this is the closeness centrality uh, in the same blocking event as before. And what we can see uh, first is that there's a track of high closeness centrality, which is uh, kind of deviated on the region of the block. And the region of the block itself is characterized by very low closeness values. So this indicates that the, the blocking region, uh, the, yeah, the blocking cell is isolated from the main atmospheric currents. Then it's interesting to compare uh, this closeness field to the wind field. So here we have uh, in the bottom the, the wind at 300 hectopascal. Um, and what we can see is that they look quite similar, but there are some differences. And those differences are important. So for instance, here in the wind field, we have a region of high, uh, high values, so high wind. Uh, whereas in the closeness, this is not the case. And the reason for that is that the wind field is like, a, it's a local field, whereas the closeness highlights uh, currents. So it's more global. And so in that sense, like a re an isolated region with high wind will not be highlighted by the closeness. Um, then we also noticed that typically the closeness tends to be stronger or higher at the entrance of the jet. So it was here and then decreases as we go towards the exit of the jet strikes. Okay, so those are the conclusions for the first part of this talk. Uh, so we have seen that we can construct the Lagrangian flow network to describe the atmospheric circulation and that the degree, the closeness, um, and in my thesis, I also showed that the entropy are able to uh, capture very important characteristics of those blocking events. Um, and then we saw this interesting property of the closeness, which is to highlight the main atmospheric currents. Okay, so we can go now to the second part where we have used a network based on correlation to anticipate abrupt changes in systems with irregular oscillations. And we'll see some application to El Nino. Um, so first I will explain how the network is constructed. So it's a different type of network and then um, we will see that um, percolation measures from these type of correlation networks have been used to anticipate bifurcations. Now, in our case, we were interested in going beyond the case of bifurcations and looking specifically at systems with uh, irregular oscillations. So what we will do is try to characterize the behavior of percolation properties um, in systems with irregular oscillations. And then what we want to know is if those properties are able to anticipate abrupt changes in these systems. So to do that, um, we applied the network and uh, percolation framework to a system of, st of stochastic Fitzsagnagomo oscillators. Uh, so I will explain that first. And then we will see that the, the conclusions that we can get from that are useful to better understand some network uh, forecasting of El Nino and La Nina. Okay, so this is the construction of the network. The nodes are spatial locations again. And here the links are constructed based on correlation between time series at those different nodes. So the time series uh, represent the evolution of the state of the system at uh, each of the nodes. And so we compute pairwise correlations between uh, those time series. And 
if the correlation is higher than a certain threshold, which is called gamma here, then we set up a link between the two nodes. So the nodes are spatial locations and the links here represent the correlation in the system. Um, now, this type of networks have had many applications and one of them is for the prediction of bifurcations. Uh, so we know that as a system approaches a bifurcation, the spatial correlations increase. And uh, the consequence is that in a network like this, the link density will increase. Um, and the link density will reach its maximum at the bifurcation, at the tipping point. But what's interesting is that before it reaches its maximum, there's like a, a percolation-like transition in the network. And so it's this percolation and anticipating the percolation itself that can provide very early warning signals for bifurcations. So there are different ways to measure the cluster or percolation uh, properties of, uh, of a network. And um, for, for instance, we can use the relative size of the largest connected component, which is um, the size of the largest cluster in the network. And it's what I've highlighted in pink here uh, each time. And then there are other, other measures like the probability that a randomly chosen node belongs to a component of size two or three or four. So it's like a measure of the number of small components in the network. And this uh, tends to decrease as we go, as the largest cluster uh, grows. Okay, so um, this was for bifurcation. And though, like I said, in our case, we are interested in systems which have uh, very sharp oscillations. So what we want to know is how these same network properties behave in systems which present these oscillations and if they can anticipate uh, those uh, upward changes. So to do that, we will first look at the system of coupled stochastic fitzsack nagumo oscillators. Um, all right, so this is the system that we study. We have uh, 500 oscillators, so that means 500 nodes. And at each node, we have two uh, time series whose evolution is given by those uh, two equations, so u and b. So this part is the fitzsack nagumo part. Then this is diffusion, and there's some noise in the system. And in addition, we choose uh, this epsilon here to be like we select a new value randomly after a full oscillation of the system is completed. And in that sense, we get irregular oscillations uh, that just makes the system more interesting and challenging to study. Then we study this on a one-dimensional lattice with periodic boundary conditions. So we integrate the system and those are the solutions that we get. Um, here at the top is for the variable u and at the bottom for the variable v. And what we see, uh, so like the horizontal is uh, time and the vertical is space, so the 500 uh, nodes of the system. And we see that we have very sharp um, asymmetric oscillations in the variable u um, and that uh, in space, so among the nodes, they are nearly homogeneous, not completely, but uh, quite homogeneous. Then here I just show uh, like one of these time series, if we take like one of the nodes, this is what the, the, the time series look like, and just to give you a better idea of the, the shape. Okay, now what we want to do is to construct a network describing the correlation in the variable u. So we will only consider the variable, the variable u and not the variable v, so we ignore any information from v. Um, and to construct that network, we take um, a sliding time window so that we get a time-dependent correlation network. So a time-dependent network describing the correlation in the variable u. So we construct this network and then what we ask is if the percolation properties of the network can anticipate the those abrupt changes in the variable u, so those changes here. Okay, so first we look at the size, the relative size of the largest connected component. So again, the size of the largest cluster in the network. Um, the top is the same as before. And here in the bottom, so the, the gray shading uh, indicates the region of the jump. And the red line corresponds to that quantity, the size of the largest connected component. And we see that it starts increasing sometimes, uh, sometime before every jump. And then it peaks at the moment of the jump and then there's a sharp uh, decrease. 
So it's essentially anticipating uh, the jumps. Then we also looked at the probability that a randomly chosen node belongs to a component of size two. Uh, so again, that's a measure of the, like somehow it's a measure of the number of small components in the system. And we see that this measure tends to have a peak sometime before every jump. And uh, so it's also a good anticipator for the jumps. And then um, I also want to comment that here we chose the, the correlation threshold in the network. So the, the threshold at which we decide if a correlation is significant enough or not to set up a link, we choose it to be 0 0.7. No. Okay, so um, we saw that those two measures can anticipate uh, those abrupt changes. And now what we can ask is why does this work? So why is there an increase in the connectivity, which means an increase in the correlations uh, in, the, in the network before every jump? So this is the formula for the correlation. And because the system here is not stationary, we have two possibilities, like two, two processes that could trigger this increase in correlation. Um, the first one is that there's a global trend or like a, a common tendency among all individual oscillators before the jump, going towards the jump. The other possibility is that there is an increase in the correlation of the fluctuations on top of that trend um, uh, before the jump. So to test those two possibilities, what we did is to remove the trend from the data. So we use a Gaussian kernel to do that. And so we just keep the fluctuations essentially. So this is what the field looked like now. And um, so what we do is that we construct the same network and compute the same measures for the, well, the field of fluctuations. And this is what we get. So we find that the relative size of the largest connected component uh, and the probability that a randomly chosen node belongs to a component of size two still anticipate um, those abrupt changes, but they do that at a lower correlation threshold. Um, and so, yeah, so like before we had 0 0.7, now we have 0 0.5. And so what we conclude is that the anticipation that was obtained before in the non-detrended data was likely a combination of both effects, the global trend or global tendency, and the increase in the correlation of the fluctuations uh, on top of that trend. Okay, so now we can see some application to El Nino and La Nina. Um, so El Nino so far oscillation is an irregular oscillation in winds and sea surface temperatures uh, in the tropical eastern Pacific Ocean. So uh, more or less in this region that I've shown here. And essentially when the temperatures are higher than normal, this is an El Nino event. And when they are lower than normal, it's a La Nina event. Um, and the, the return period of El Nino is about like two to seven years. So it's a very irregular oscillation. Um, and there are several studies that have used these network and percolation ideas to anticipate El Nino and, and La Nina. And one of them is a study from Rodriguez Mendez et al. Um, so in 2016, well, they constructed a correlation network in this region. So the, the nodes of the network were points um, in, in this region. And then the links were based on the correlation of sea surface temperature. Um, and they did that using a 200 day sliding window. So, um, so yeah, they got a time dependent network describing the correlation of sea surface temperatures here. And then they computed the, those measures. So the, the relative size of the largest connected component, um, which I show here. So in this graph, what we see is the, the gray line is the mean um, of the temperature anomaly in this region. And so the, the drop here corresponds to a La Nina event and the dashed line indicates the beginning of this event. And then here it's a different period. We have an El Nino event and then a La Nina event. And what we see is that the relative size of the largest connected component, uh, well, tends to peak either just at the moment of the beginning of the event, either sometime before. So it anticipates the El Nino and La Nina. Um, in this study, they also looked at the probability that a randomly chosen node belongs to a component of size two. And they found that that quantity tends to have a peak and then a sharp drop sometime before the event. So I've indicated like the, the anticipation that is given by this uh, here in gray. So this is also a good indicator. 
Okay, so this was uh, done by these people, Rodriguez Mendez and others. And what we want to ask here is um, if the percolation which is occurring before El Nino and La Nina is due to a global trend in the sea surface temperatures, or if it's due to an increase in the correlation of the fluctuations on top of that. So to determine this, we uh, did the same, well we, well, we did the same methodology as before. So we did trend the, the first temperatures and we obtain uh, just the fluctuations. And then we repeated uh, the calculation of the network and of these different measures. And what we found essentially is that no, there's no signal after the trending. And so the conclusion is that the percolation was likely due to a global tendency in the sea surface temperatures before an Nino and La Nina event, um, which, is, which still can be very detected very early on by the network. So it's still a nice property of the network. And okay, so those are the conclusions for the, the second part. Uh, so we saw that the percolation precursors can anticipate different stages of the oscillations uh, in the Fitzsegnagomo system that um, the well, we characterize the processes causing this uh, the, the percolation and this helps us better understand some network forecasting of El Nino and La Nina. Okay, and um, no, going to the third part. Um, on the Madden oscillation. Uh, and so we will use some model to model the Madden oscillation. So the Madden oscillation is a large scale weather system uh, in the tropic. It consists of basically two parts one part with enhanced convection, so that means enhanced rainfalls, and one part with suppressed convections. And this whole system uh, travels in the tropics, so at the equator, going around the Earth in about 30 to 60 days. And as it travels, it's uh, affecting the weather in different parts of the, the globe. So here are some more characteristics of the MGO. Uh, first, we have the geographical confinement of the convective activity. So um, the, the convective activity associated with the MGO is strongest from the Indian Ocean to the Western Pacific. So that's where we usually see it the most. Um, then the eastward propagation of this MJO is of about five meters per second. Um, importantly, there's intermittent generation of MJO events. So this means that the MJO is not always there, but sometimes it's on, sometimes it's off, sometimes it's stronger, weaker. Um, and MJO is an envelope of small scale convection. So it's a multi-scale system. Uh, so that's what is illustrated here. If this thing in blue is the MJO, then within the MGO, we have super cloud clusters. And with super cloud clusters, we have other smaller cloud clusters. So very hierarchical structure. Okay, and like I said, um, when the MGO propagates, it affects different types of weather. So first it has an effect on the monsoons in India, uh, China and Australia. It also affects tropical cyclones. It generates waves with how, which have an effect on blocking events in the mid latitudes. Um, and uh, it affects El Nino southern oscillation when it comes to the tropical Pacific. So the point is that a better representation of the MGO in climate models would greatly improve the predictability of many of those events. And here what we do is that uh, we study the MGO with a minimalistic model. So this model is called the stochastic MJO skeleton model. Um, and uh, well, so far, this uh, model here has been mainly forced with um, idealized uh, forcing functions. And in our case, what we, what we wanted to do is use more realistic functions. So we use functions that are based on observation and are time dependent. So I will explain how this is done first. And then I will show you some of the model outputs when we do this. And then the, the question that we ask is if the model, when forced with those realistic forcing function, um, can replicate key characteristics of MJO events. So uh, I will explain how we can identify MJO events. I will um, then compare some characteristics 
of MJO in the model and in observation. And then we look uh, at the influence of El Nino and La Nina on the MJO in the model. All right, so um, well, this uh, skeleton model was developed by Maida and Stechman in 2009. And it's a minimalistic model which reproduces what they call the MJO skeleton. So by skeleton, they mean the planetary scale features of the MJO. So like I said before, uh, the MJO has a multi-scale structure. And what is modeled here is this envelope uh, of convective activity, so the, the dashed line, and none of the details within the envelope. Uh, so those are the equations of the model. Um, the first part are the primitive equations. So they are um, like standard equations to model the dynamics of the atmosphere. Uh, so they model the wind speeds, um, the, the pressure potential temperature and so on based on conservation laws. And then the key equation in the model is this one. Uh, it's a dynamic equation for the convective activity and it's what allows the model to reproduce the MJO. So the key mechanism that is encoded here is that positive moisture creates a tendency to enhance convective activity. So here, um, A is the envelope of convective activity, Q is the lower tropospheric moisture. Um, and so, so yeah, it's a very simple equation. It's based on observation that suggests that uh, generally lower tropospheric moisture leads to convective activity. That's uh, simply that. Um, then, uh, like I said before, the MJO is not always the same, like sometimes it's stronger and stronger and sometimes it's weaker. And so one way to reproduce this, uh, to have a realistic variability of the MJO is to make A a stochastic variable. Uh, so this was done uh, in this paper here. And um, so A is now controlled by birth death process. And the up and down transition rates were chosen such that on average we recover that equation here. So this is what we would use in our model. So it's a stochastic model. Okay, so those are the equations that uh, we implement. Um, okay, so a couple of comments. Uh, first, it's a minimalistic model. So it has only three parameters and we choose the values of those parameters according to previous papers on the, the model simply. Then it has two forcing functions, uh, radiative cooling and latent heating. So radiative cooling is essentially the heat lost uh, from the Earth by radiations, and latent heating is uh, the, the heat released by condensation of water vapor uh, into droplets in the atmosphere. So those are the two forcing functions. And then, um, well, this model is three-dimensional. So uh, a standard thing for to, to implement this model is to do some vertical and meridional truncations so that in the end we actually get the model on a one dimension line along the equator. So all the variables that we are modeling are on this line. Okay, so um, like I said before, in previous studies, these forcing functions were mainly chosen to be very mathematically simple and uh, independent of time. And in our case, uh, what we wanted to do is make them more realistic. So we base them on observations and we make them time dependent. The way that this is done is by following a method from uh, Ogorsky and Stechman here. So the, the two forcing functions are based on observations of latent heat flux and precipitations, which come from NSEP. Um, and uh, yeah, and we keep the time dependency, but what we do is that we smooth the profiles using a three month uh, moving average. This is just to avoid two sharp variations in the profiles, which could disturb the, the model. So we compute those functions and this is what we get uh, for both forcing profiles. So this horizontal line is this uh, one line, one dimension okay. line along the equator that I just showed. And vertical is the, the time. And so we see that we have some seasonal variations in the profile. We also see that they look uh, quite similar. They are not exactly the same, but they look similar. And the reason behind this is because uh, there's this condition in the model that, um, well, well, this should be satisfied. So S theta and S Q are not independent. They depend on one another. 
Okay, so once we have the forcing profile, we um, we implement the model and we compute the output. And so uh, here I show the output for the convective activity. We also get output for the wind and the pressure and other fields. Um, but the convective activity is the most related to the MJO. On the left, we have the raw output. And um, what we can see is that uh, most of the activity is confined to this region, which I mentioned before, from the Indian Ocean to the uh, Eastern Pacific. And then uh, if we do some filtering of the data, so we keep only the intraseasonal signal and also the large scale modes. So we keep only wave numbers up to four. So large scale planetary waves. Then we start to see some uh, propagating waves uh, here. And they have speeds that are close to the mean speed of the MGO, which uh, before I said was five meters per second. Then uh, we can also just compare the long-term average of observed and model convective activity. We see that they agree very well. Um, and then we can look at the variance of the model and observed convective activity, uh, where for the model, we keep only the larger scale waves. So we keep only up to spatial mode 14. We see that here too, we have a good agreement. So in general, there's good agreement between the convective activity in the model and in observations uh, when considering planetary scales, which is what we are interested in here. Okay, now that, um, that we have the, this data, we need some objective way to identify the MJO events within it. And this is done by using a real-time multivariate uh, index. Uh, so it's the RMM index. This index uh, allows to keep track of where the MJO is and how strong it is. And the advantage of using this is that it has been developed both in the model and uh, well, for observation. Initially, it was developed for observations. So it's like, it makes it very easy to compare the characteristics between both. To compute this index in the model, we need the data from the zonal wind and convective activity. And then uh, it's a principal component based index. So the idea is to compute the first two empirical orthogonal functions um, from these, uh, uh, these combined two fields after filtering all the annual and interannual variability. Um, and uh, once we have those two UFs, we project the daily values of wind and convective activity onto them to obtain a pair of principal components, RMM1 and RMM2. Together, they form the RMM index. Um, so, so this projection essentially serves as a filter for, for the MJO signal. And the best way to, to actually look at uh, this index or at RMM1 and RMM2 is to plot it in a diagram like this. So with RMM1 in the horizontal and RMM2 in the vertical. So here I show like a, it's a 52 day simulation. So each point corresponds to the state of the MGO or the value of the RMM index on a different day of simulation. Um, the distance of the point to the center indicates the amplitude of the MGO. Um, so generally, we say that the MJO is active when its amplitude is larger than one. So that means when it lies outside of the circle. Um, so so this would be this would belong to an MJO event, these dark blue dots. Um, then the eastward progression of the MJO in that diagram corresponds to the counterclockwise progression of the points. And also the diagram is divided into eight phases. So uh, this gives us some indication of where the MJO is uh, located. So for instance, when the dots are here, then we know that the convective system associated with the MJO is in the Indian Ocean, then it goes to maritime continents and so on. Okay, so um, this index makes it very easy to identify certain characteristics of the MJO. So for instance, here we will look at the duration of MJO events the total angle that is covered in RMM phase space, and by that I mean the angle from that point to that point, and the maximum RMM amplitude, which here would be somewhere around here. Uh, so what we do is that we compute, uh, using this index, we compute all the MJO events in the model and in observations, and then look at those characteristics. And here I plotted the cumulative distribution of these characteristics for uh, the three of them. We see that they seem to agree very well in general. Uh, and this was also confirmed in most cases by performing a Komogorov Smirnov test. 
Then we also looked at the seasonality of MGO events. So that's the number of MGO uh, events per, uh, for each month of the year, or like the relative number of them. We see that in observation, so this black line, we have a clear seasonality, whereas in the model, we don't have this. And um, we think that the reason behind this is that uh, like we average the forcing profiles over three months. And so we kind of blur the differences between seasons. Okay, and finally, uh, observations have suggested that um, El Nino and La Nina modulate certain characteristics of the MJO. For instance, its lifetime, the extent of its eastward progressions and, and other characteristics. So what we wanted to see is if the model can capture some of the influence of ENZO on MJO events. And uh, to do that, we computed uh, the MJO events in the model and we separated the one that uh, occurred during neutral ENZO, during El Nino and during La Nina. And then we looked at the same characteristics and what we find here is that uh, the model does not seem to identify any differences in the duration, the angle, and the amplitude of MJO events uh, as a function of ENZO. And this was in fact uh, confirmed that there's no uh, significant differences again by performing a Kolmogorov Smirnov test. Okay, so that's it for the third part. Um, we have forced the MGO skeleton model with observation based and time dependent forcing, so with more realistic functions. We've seen that it can reproduce quite well certain characteristics uh, of the MGO, uh, but that um, it's a minimalistic model, and so of course it has also some limitations, especially in representing the influence of ENSO. And uh, those are the global conclusions. So uh, just quickly in the first part, we use this Lagrangian flow network to represent the atmospheric flow. We've seen that uh, the characteristics of this Lagrangian flow network can reproduce uh, characteristics of blocking events. Then uh, in the second part, we have used a different type of network based on correlations to anticipate our changes in the system of Pitsak Nagum oscillators. And by uh, looking more in depth at the mechanism hit there, then we uh, found some better understanding of uh, network-based precursors for El Nino and La Nina. And uh, finally, we looked at this model for the MJO and we forced it with realistic forcing functions and we saw that it reproduces certain characteristics of MGO, but has limitations too. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Marie, for the presentation. Now it's uh, time for some questions or some comments. One, uh, uh, the second, uh, uh, the other one with the questions. Ah, sorry. People normally leave for these questions, okay? <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Bye bye. We're not going to torture you, don't worry. <laughs> That's it is not a torture session, <laughs> uh, it's just curiosity. Anyway, so please. Okay, so thanks, Noemi. Um, so just, uh, just to say before starting with some question that. Yeah, congratulations for for you know putting together in this thesis these three different topics uh, you know, from net 